I'm going to. Yes, I'm going to record this, I guess, someplace, uh, just so that others can come back and take a look at it. And um, so anyway, the topic that I'd like to begin with is how to handle um, Kelly offers. So to do that, we begin with a, uh, let's see if I can get this shared and let everybody see what it is. And unfortunately, this is the thing that uh, uh, the point where I am uh, not able to actually see what I am sharing. Can anybody out there at least respond and let me know that uh, you're seeing the form <laughs> that I have on the screen called No Cooperation Office Exclusive? Yes, we can yeah. see it. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I may have mentioned this before, but I use several different systems to teach. Uh, the one that I'm using most of the time is Microsoft Teams. And so when I come back to using Zoom, things are in different places. So it takes me a few minutes to figure out the uh, interface on the software to figure out where I'm at and what's going on. So at any rate, to handle an offer with uh, Kelly Offers, one of the things that you want to do to begin with is protect yourself by having a listing agreement. Uh, and with that listing agreement, uh, you want to make sure that you have completed this form and submitted it to the multiple listing service. By having the listing agreement uh, with your seller client prior to seeking a cash offer through Kelly Offers, uh, it protects you because you have the listing agreement. You have an agency agreement that authorizes you to give advice to your seller client uh, and specifically where you can continue to give advice when various different types of cash offers are received. So one of the first steps with, with the process is to, of course, disclose working with real estate agents, which by the way, is a new form. And um, I'm trying to get to, oh, I see why I got the wrong form up there uh, initially. I'm in the wrong folder. Let me bring up the offer to, or excuse me, the listing. Well, I don't need to do that right now, but establish a listing agreement and then make sure you use this form, the uh, form titled no cooperation office exclusive and withheld form. And then that way you have a basis to move forward, seek an offer from Kelly Offers. And many times they won't confirm your compensation, or at least it's my understanding that they will not confirm your compensation until an offer is submitted. So in a sense, you have no uh, authority to be compensated through Kelly Offers. And that's why it's necessary to have a listing agreement. And it's necessary to have this form because you may sell the property through Kelly Offers outside, totally outside of the um, MLS. And note with the form that you cannot cooperate with brokers outside of, your, of Keller Williams Raleigh or Wake Forest. The listing cannot be publicly marketed by anyone uh, and if the listing is to be publicly marketed, then it must be put in the multiple listing service within 24 hours. So once, if all the offers that you receive through Kelly Offers are turned down and it's time to list the property, then you already have your listing agreement in place as well. And you've negotiated a compensation. Now, what if your compensation that you have in your listing agreement is less than the um, amount that you're being paid, or maybe it's more than the amount that's being paid by Kelly Offers. That would be the time that it would be an issue. Well, let me open up Form 101, which is the listing agreement. And hopefully you all are seeing the exclusive right to sell now. And again, the place that you're putting the compensation in is right, first of all, 
By the way, please be sure that you put a list price in when you take a listing and have it signed by the seller. A seller should not be asked to sign a blank doc or documents with blanks in it, uh, particularly when it comes to sale price. Um, it's one of the things I run into occasionally when I'm reviewing the files. Make sure there's a price in there on the sale price of the home. Then when it comes to your compensation, this is always, of course, a negotiable amount. It can either be a percentage or a fixed fee or that type of thing. But if, for instance, that you got an offer through Kelly Offers and your listing agreement had originally said uh, you were getting paid 6%, and now through Kelly Offers, you're getting paid just one side of the transaction, and you agree to do that for your seller client, and you're only gonna get paid two and a half percent. Then to handle that difference so that the seller's not paying the difference in compensation, meaning between two and a half and six, just draft an email and say that you're not going to charge the seller for that difference, that you're revising your compensation to be two and a half percent. Just, I highly recommend you put something in writing. Not technically required, as far as I understand from the Real Estate Commission and also the forms, NCAR forms folks, but it's always a good idea to have anything like that put into writing. And by the way, that same would be true with a buyer agency agreement. We've, in discussions with the NCAR uh, attorney, um, they were communicated to me that they felt it would be okay that if you had a higher amount in your compensation, for instance, in the buyer agency agreement, and let me just bring that one up. which would be 201. I used to teach and share in the past that when you did a buyer agency agreement that you would put in 2.4 resale, 2.5 new construction and 3%, um, 4% or some other number for, for sale by owner, FISBO. Uh, or land, you could add a land in, or that you could put in 2.4% Raleigh, 3% Orange County, or however you wanted to write it, there needed to be a definite amount and be sure it's not a range. Do not use per MLS and do not put a zero in there or an NA, because obviously if it's a zero or an NA, you're agreeing not to get paid. And we all like to get paid, I'm sure. So be sure you put a number in there. So what I'm recommending that you do is put a 3% in this blank right here, or four. And then at a later point, when you get down to the port portion regarding dual agency, and this is another one I still, another area I still find agents are not real clear on, is, is the designation of, dual, designated dual and exclusive. And the client needs to initial in these three lines or there needs to be an NA in those lines. There should either be initial or an NA in all three of those lines. That should not come to me blank. And I'm still getting them, uh, still getting agency agreements, both the listing side and the buyer agency agreement where all three of those lines are blank. When that happens, you have no agency agreement. Um, now, 3% on line 4B or 4%, whatever you're comfortable putting. And then when you do that, then you put in a dual agency compensation here of maybe 6%. Uh, and then if it's less than the 2, uh, 3%, then just inform the client that it's less. KW is okay with that, but I would just recommend that you uh, make sure that it's documented in an email and maybe make a PDF of the email and upload it to the command. Uh, so I wanna be sure that I've covered this though. I wanna circle back here. Does anybody have any questions about the use 
of this particular form. This is where you're withholding it from the MLS. Any questions on that? Okay. Trying to see who all we've got here, so. All right, let me uh, move on to a couple other things. Uh, the, the next thing I'd like to just be sure that I show you is the new um, property disclosure form. And I have uploaded these with a template, first of all, uh, for buyers. I've uploaded it for buyers. And uh, there is, uh, again, the form is already pre-populated because it's the agent that fills in the checkbox on this uh, new agency disclosure form. And by the way, this form is required to be used as of July the 1st. Uh, they put it into, into operation, the Real Estate Commission did early so that they could uh, be sure that the agents across the state were aware of it and that they uh, got used to using it. The old um, working with real estate agents brochure uh, your good friend and mine, this thing, this working with real estate agents brochure is no longer going to be around. This is being retired and a new brochure that will be a questions and answers on working with real estate agents uh, will be uh, some coming out sometime as I understand before the 1st of July. Now it is not necessary, believe it or not, to give your clients the new question and answers on working with real estate agents. I highly recommend it, but it's not required. Um, it is required for you to give them a copy of questions and answers on home inspections and a couple other documents that go along with the, with the material. But uh, this form still it is the one and only form that you use for working with real estate agents disclosure. Be sure that you disclose to your clients that Keller Williams practices all three kinds of agency that are listed there, actually all four kinds. We practice all types of agency, buyer agency, which would be exclusive buyer agency. We practice dual agency and we practice designated dual agency. Now, as a reminder the difference between exclusive, you, when they sign this disclosure, and that's all this is, this is not an agency agreement. This is a disclosure only. And interestingly enough, they still put on the form, which is helpful, right here at the beginning, telling your client or your potential client, uh, this is not a contract. This is a disclosure only. But this disclosure is absolutely required at first substantial contact. Anybody remember what first substantial contact is? When they start sharing personal information with you. That's great. Thank you for that. Yes, when they uh, first start sharing personal information with you, which would deal with their needs and their wants, and or you as the agent begin to act in such a way as it might be inferred that you're working on their behalf. So there's two criteria for first substantial contact. Uh, if they begin to reveal confidential information or if you begin to act in a manner such that uh, it might be interpreted that you're working on their behalf. Um, so what's interesting is I can't get into the meeting on another, the, my second computer here. Okay, let's try the other one and see if that one's gonna let me go. Sorry about this.
I'm getting the host has another meeting in progress. So it's not letting me do what I normally do. So at any rate, I can't see what you're seeing, just so you know. Uh, hopefully you're seeing the working with real estate agents disclosure for buyers. Yes, we are. Okay, great. Thank you so much. But again, make sure your client or your prospect knows that we practice all kinds of agency. We start out as an exclusive buyer agent as long as you're showing properties listed by other firms. When you show a property listed by Keller Williams Raleigh or Wake Forest, then you enter into the phase of dual agency. Now, dual agency means that you cannot give advice. You cannot advocate on behalf of either party and as a dual agent, even though you're working with a buyer on the buyer side only, you also now represent the seller. In dual agency, you represent both parties equally without disclosing confidential information about either one. You cannot help one to the expense of another or to the harm of another. You work for both parties and all the agents within the Keller Williams offices in North Raleigh and Wake Forest work for both parties, both seller and buyer. The advantage of operating with designated agency is that when you enter into designated agency, the broker in charge designates one agent who's usually the one that brings the buyer to the transaction to work to be the designated agent working exclusively for the buyer. And the BIC designates the listing agent to work exclusively with the seller. Now, if you're the seller's listing agent and the buyer and a, have a buyer agency agreement with the buyer and your buyer wants to put an offer in on your listing, then you have to step back up to dual and once again, you enter into a position where you are a transaction coordinator. You are a facilitator. And even though you're representing both the buyer and the seller, you must do so equally, treat each of them honestly and fairly, and not provide information to one that would harm the other. That's uh, really a risky position to be in. I've chosen not to practice real estate that way. If I would get into that type of position, usually I would refer the buyer out if I was the listing agent. However, make sure that the person that you're going to be working with understands this agency disclosure. And again, since, real, since Keller Williams Raleigh and Wake Forest practices all types of agency, including unrepresented buyer, we have already checked I have set the template up that's in DocuSign and the one without checks is up there also. But uh, I recommend you use this one. And then it also has filled in the name of the firm, Keller Williams Raleigh. Um, I didn't think about Wake Forest. Maybe that's something we need. Uh, the main office is Keller Williams Raleigh. Wake Forest is actually considered a branch office. Um, so anyway, that's this new form that gets utilized. Please start using it right away so you get in, a, uh, in the habit of doing so. Um, other things that, that occasionally come up, let me show you the offer to purchase and contract, the 2T form and talk about something with that. I'm, uh, how's your real estate business out there? How are you doing in the business? Crying. What's that? <laughs> Crying because I can't get a, get a house to my clients without it being under contract before I can get to the showing. Crying. That's a good. That's a good. <laughs> it's not working. Well, it's an interesting marketplace. I've been involved in real estate since two thousand and three, and I've not seen anything like this. I tell you, it's just different. That's right. Um, one of the things that I'd like to caution everybody on is uh, in reviewing the transaction files, I am seeing extremely high due diligence fees being paid. This thing right here. 
10, 20, 30, even $100,000 of due diligence on a $300,000 house. It was a cash offer, but still. Um, and that's what I'm, I'm seeing in order to win a deal with 20 or more offers on a property right now, people indeed are paying 10, $20,000 in due diligence fees. Please, please be sure that your client understands they're gonna lose that money if they walk away. They lose the due diligence if they walk away, even if the seller has not revealed something because the seller doesn't have to reveal anything. And they should really under, you should explain that to them as well. That when they submit an offer, this offer to purchase and contract is an as is purchase. They're buying the house, whether there's structural issues, whether there's water in the crawl space, whether the roof leaks, whether there's an encroachment, well, encroachment might make the title non-marketable, but um, no matter the situation, pretty much once, they, once they've got under contract, that due diligence money is at risk and it's due on the effective date of the contract. So um, just holding that due diligence fee doesn't protect your buyer because if they don't deliver it to after the seller is signed and communicated back to the buyer, buyer's agent or the buyer, uh, the due diligence money is due and they can go to court, the seller can go to court and sue the buyer for the due diligence money. And if it's 50 grand, I'd think they'll sue for that because the contract's very clear on when it's due and that type of thing. All right, um, can I ask you a question on that same note with the due diligence fee? If it's not delivered, the buyer, it, are they in breach of the contract or is it still a contract? Uh, it's still a contract. Right. Because see, we have some agents who come in and call me and say stuff like, well, the due diligence hasn't been um, delivered, so I'm not going to change it in the MLS on the contract until I get that due diligence. Right here, page two of the contract. <laughs> Effective date of the contract, signed and communicated. Two steps. Nothing about due diligence fee. Right. Over here, due diligence fee, it tells you when it's due. Um, and um, the due diligence fee is non-refundable. Again, that's important to note. When it's due, it shall be the property of the seller on the effective date and shall be a credit to the buyer at closing. So whether it's still sitting in the buyer's hand or not, again, I'm not an attorney, but that sure sounds to me like that even if it's still in the buyer's hand, that check belongs to the seller. Right. So that money belongs to the seller. So uh, read the contract would be my response. <laughs> now I will say, Art, I have reached out to, uh, NC Rec and asked them because there was a particular situation that, ha that happened where the buyer would not release their um, due diligence check. And in that particular instance, I asked the attorney uh, if we could force them. He said, you can sue them. You cannot right. force them to give that check up if you have not had it in your hand. No, you don't want to show up on their doorstep and say, give me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that would so, be a good idea. No, that's not a good idea. Right. No, that's that's unfortunately how most real estate disputes eventually get resolved. If the mm -hmm. two parties can't come to an agreement, really the way this gets resolved is you take them to court. Right. But guess what? The losing party pays the other party's attorney fees. Absolutely. And this contract, again, I'll say it again, is very clear as to when these monies are due and who gets them when. And if it goes to court, the judge is gonna go and or judge and jury, hopefully will go by what the contract says. So it's, you know, not thinking you're not gonna to have to turn over that $50,000 because you're, uh, you're stubborn or you're, you know, you're gonna stand your ground 
may not be a good idea because attorneys are not cheap either. No. Okay, I'm seeing uh, a lot of, uh, of, of agents are doing much better in recent days. I'm seeing some substantial improvement on reviewing files. Although I am seeing a lot of things that are missed, uh, forgetting to be included and that type of thing. So let me just review. We would like you to have, um, once you have your buyer agency agreement and you're working with real estate agents, uh, disclosures signed, it would be a good idea to go, we would like you to go ahead and upload them into uh, KW Command and submit them for review under consultation. Uh, this and, um, but on your listing agreement, wait until the listing agreement is signed. But once the listing agreement is signed, if you're waiting on the house to be measured, and by the way, that's taking some time, I understand these days. It's taking a week sometimes, as much as a week to get a house measured. Yeah. Please do not put it in the MLS until you have measured the house, either you personally or uh, you've hired somebody to do that for you, another professional appraisal or appraiser or whoever. If you wanna go ahead and list the property then what you can do is just delay your marketing date. Let me go, this is the buyer agency. Here's the listing agreement, right? Um, well, this is buyer agency. I apologize. I got the wrong form number. They look similar in some aspects. But under, where's the paragraph on marketing? We're not quite there, right? So is that similar to the coming soon where it's like a 14 day period? Uh, coming, coming soon is 30 days. Oh, I thought it was only 14 days. No, coming soon is 30 days. Oh. So how long can you delay marketing date? Indefinitely. <laughs> Your contract is not affected until this date right here under paragraph 10. So you can go ahead and sign the agency agreement, the listing agreement, so you get the seller under agreement, under contract to work with you. And then if it's going to take you a week to get a house measured or whatever else that you want to do, just insert a marketing date a week out. That way you already have your agency agreement in place and you don't have to put it into MLS until 24 hours after that marketing date. Now, when you do coming soon, you actually have to upload pictures, three pictures and all the information about the listing. And it can be in a more or less, you know, coming soon state for 30 days. And the form to do that, by the way, is this right here. Again, this is also up in command, up in uh, DocuSign. And um, here's where the rules are. It can be moved to another stat, or it may be moved to another status, active no showings before midnight on the 30th day in the coming soon status. If not moved by the listing broker, the MLS will automatically update the status to active and make it available for showings. So uh, again, this, this is the proper form that if you're going to not show the property for a period of time because you want the property to be painted or new carpet is being installed or uh, the seller wants to declutter, whatever the reason, this is the appropriate form to use. Or do we have this form in the DocuSign under Triangle MLS? Yes. Okay. And we have that other new form, the certification uh, to withhold. Right. The office exclusive. That's not yeah. the right name. It, whatever the name of it was. That office exclusive. exclusive. Yeah. yeah. No cooperation office exclusive. That form is now up there as well. I checked. Awesome. I don't know what happened with that. I was sure I had that uploaded when the change was made, but maybe it got dropped somehow. But 
at any rate, it should all the newest, latest, greatest forms should be up there. And if you see something, please let me know and I'll do my best to get it fixed. And now, so are, is this the form when we're on the listing agreement and it asks the question office exclusive? Yes. That we check that we have to make sure this has been signed as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it takes two forms. One is the authorization by the seller to right. do what you're going to do. And the second one is notification to the MLS. Do you, when is a good time to use this one, that, that, an example that we could use this one for? Um, it, this, this view, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm just asking the question so that way if anybody is trying well, to figure Keller out. Keller offers, we talked, we came up with that one. So yep. Keller offers, this is a good time to use this. Another one would be that if you're getting a, um, you're in the process of listing the, thinking of listing the property, if you've had a discussion with the seller and the seller says, I've been talking to uh, one of my neighbors and they may want to buy the property uh, and you get an offer, you know, right as soon as you have it listed within that first 24 hours. Awesome. Um, or you, you're bringing a buyer to the transaction and um, you know, I, I normally we use form 150 for the um, unrepresented seller. So, right. Yeah. Um, But like in the situation where we had the agent who was not planning to sell our house and someone knocked on the door and said, hey, want to buy your house? And she really didn't want to put it in the MLS. This, um, but by her being an agent, she was, uh, the, uh, you know, the Triangle MLS told me that because she had a cooperating uh, broker on the other side that they recommend she puts it in. Um, well, she said recommend, then she changed it to require. I'm listening to George. I got my sound piece in the back, y'all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, she was telling her because of that, she wanted it to be put in the MLS in order for that um, agent on the other side to get the credit for the sale. Well, we normally would put a, uh, we have all, normally with our listing agreement and our buyer agency agreement, we get our client to give us permission to put the sale in the MLS if it's an unrepresented buyer or an unrepresented, well, if you're, if the unrepresented buyer, uh, you would be the listing agent, you would put it in the MLS. Yeah, we right. that's right. In the MLS for comp purposes. Right, that's what she said for comp purposes. If nothing else, she could put it in after the fact and put for comp purposes only. Even though she was the owner of the house, she was an agent as well. So that was where she was seeing that that needed to be put in, even though it was her own home. I said that was that was different, but she said yes. That's what. Well, I, I don't recall that from the bylaws of the MLS, the MLS bylaws. Right. That doesn't mean it's not in there. I'm just saying I right. read that two, three times a year and I don't recall it being in there, but maybe it is. I would do what they tell you to do. <laughs> right. That's what we did. <laughs> uh, I can't that person... see that if you're the owner and you sign this, I, you know, they, it seems to me they got to abide by their own rules. But Right. But at any rate, I do what they tell you to do as long as it's not too. <laughs> I'm glad we're in agreement, Art. <laughs> well, any I, I've gone past my 30 minutes. Anybody else have any specific questions you'd like to ask? Well, I appreciate your putting your documents in the MLS as soon as possible. It gives us time to get it reviewed. Get it to the point that you want the transaction. Mm -hmm. There's six siblings, one sibling and spouse and family living in the house. Mm -hmm. They've asked me to help purchase it from the other sibling. Oh. And to just... Okay, well, 
Any other questions? If not, I appreciate you being with me here today. I uh, look forward to uh, helping you through the transaction process by getting your stuff approved. And uh, see you in a month, if not before, okay? So take Thank care. You Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.